We have the proton NMR spectrum given for an unknown compound. We do know the molecular formula of the compound, and any time a question gives you the molecular formula of the compound, the first thing that you should be thinking about doing is calculating the elements of unsaturation, sometimes called the degrees of unsaturation, and that is given by this formula right here. So we're going to go ahead and plug in the information into this formula, and this will give us the degrees of unsaturation. Now the number of carbons in the molecular formula is 4, so we'll plug that in. The number of hydrogens is 7, and then X represents the number of halogens, and we can see we have one halogen here, a chlorine. Now when we simplify this, we're going to get 2 divided by 2, which is just 1. So in this case, we have one element or one degree of unsaturation. This could be structurally either a double bond or potentially at least a ring. Now, given the fact that there are only four carbons in the molecule, a ring is unlikely because in order for a ring to exist, it would either have to be a four carbon ring or a three carbon ring with a methyl group coming off of it. But both of those rings are structurally unstable. So it's very unlikely that we have a ring in this case. And so we're gonna go with a double bond. The next thing to note is some of the information from the proton NMR. We can see here that a signal corresponding to three hydrogens would represent a methyl group. This signal with two hydrogens would be a CH2 group, and then we have two individual CH groups. It's quite likely that those are the hydrogens connected to the double bond, but we'll have to do some further analysis. So let's keep in mind that we have a double bond and a few of these groups that we just circled from the proton NMR. We can begin to posit some potential structures. So we've got four carbons, two, three, four, with a double bond. So the double bond could go there. Two, three, four carbons, the double bond could also go there. But a third option arises if we do a three carbon chain with a double bond at carbon one and then a methyl group coming off like that. These are the only three basic skeletal structures that are possible given the data. There are some redundant structures here. Some of you may be thinking, well, what if I put the double bond over there? But these two structures here and here would be the same. And then others might be thinking, well, what if I put the double bond right here? But again, these two structures would be the same. So just be careful about representing redundant structures as you try to solve the question. Now, we can begin to think about some more of the structural features here. Considering the first skeleton here, we do have to have a CH3 group, so it's possible that this carbon right here is that CH3 group. We also have to have a CH2 group, so that carbon right here would have to be the CH2 group. But then we still have to place the hydrogens in the chlorine. Now, even before we do that, we can actually pause for a moment here and understand that this structure so far is just not going to work. How do we know that? Well, consider these three hydrogens right here. If we look at the carbon not connected to those three hydrogens, but the neighboring carbon, so this carbon right here, we can see that that carbon is connected to two hydrogens. Now, the N plus one rule states that you take the number of hydrogens connected to the neighboring carbon, in this case two, and add one to it. So if we do two plus one, we would get, of course, three. That would mean that these three hydrogens would have to be a triplet on the proton NMR. But if we go back up, we can see that indeed the CH3 signal is a singlet. So this is just not going to work in terms of matching to the proton NMR. So we can actually eliminate this as a plausible structure and in fact, even the second structure might have some of those problems. So we need to have a CH3, which we might put here. But then where would the CH2 go? There would be nowhere for us to put that CH2. You couldn't put it here because you can't have two hydrogens coming off. That would create a five bonded carbon. And you can't have it over here because again, if you put two hydrogens there, you'd have a five bonded carbon. Perhaps if we put two hydrogens here and then the chlorine, that might generate a sort of CH2 signal. But the problem with that is then the other carbon adjacent would have a hydrogen and consider the splitting. So these two hydrogens right here, if we follow the N plus one rule, we would look at the neighboring carbon and the neighboring carbon has just one hydrogen connected to it. So if we follow the N plus one rule, we would have one plus one, which equals two. That would mean that this CH2 would be a doublet. But going back to the proton NMR, 
the CH2 group is not a doublet. It is, again, a singlet. So it doesn't look like the middle structure is plausible either. So we're going to have to play with the third structure and see if we can match a plausible structure to the data. So let's look at it a little bit further. We do need a CH3 group. So perhaps we can make this the CH3 group. And we're also going to need to generate that CH2 group. Now, why don't we do this? Let's make this carbon the CH2 group and then put the chlorine right here. Now this works really well actually so far because these two hydrogens, which were the CH2 group, if you look at the neighboring carbon right here, that carbon has zero hydrogens coming off of it. So zero plus one would equal one and that would give you a singlet. So that's pretty nice. And then furthermore, these three hydrogens, which remember are supposed to be a singlet, would indeed be one. Because if you look at the neighboring carbon, that same red carbon right here, we would follow the same logic. It would be zero plus one equals one. That would be a singlet as well. So this is really matching the data nicely because we have a CH3 singlet and a CH2 singlet. Now, of course, the only other structural feature are the other two hydrogens. So they must go here. And each of these should be a separate signal and they should each be a singlet. So let's find out if that's true. Here's the carbon to which they are connected, but look at the neighboring carbon. Aha, again, that neighboring carbon is connected to zero hydrogen, so zero plus one would equal one. That would be a singlet. And then this hydrogen, same story. This too would be a singlet. So everything checks out. We actually do have the correct answer in front of us. If you are wondering why those two hydrogens, by the way, are considered chemically distinct, you would have to sort of think of it in the following terms. So for those of you who want to stick around, keep on watching. Let's draw the structure again. Okay, so we've come down here below and we're going to understand why those two hydrogens were chemically unique. So we're referring to the two hydrogens over here. Remember, for those who are interested in just the answer, that would be this structure right here. But we're just trying to understand why those two hydrogens are chemically distinct. Now, what you do is you take one of the hydrogens and replace them with an element of your choice, as long as it's not an element present in the structure. So for example, we could use deuterium. This is a common choice. On the other structure, you kind of swap it. So you keep this as a hydrogen and this can be the deuterium. And then what I'm trying to show you is why these are chemically distinct. It's because with this test, we will see that we have generated stereoisomers. Now consider the fact that deuterium is heavier than hydrogen, and therefore we would rank it as number one relative to the hydrogen, which would be number two. On the other side, we have a carbon connected to a chlorine. Chlorine has a very large atomic mass, so it would be ranked number one. This methyl group up here would be ranked number two. We can see that the ones are on opposite sides, and you will recall from organic one that that means that they are the E isomer. On the other hand, over here, we have the number ones on the same side of the double bond, so that would be a Z isomer. So in fact, these are stereoisomers, and therefore, those two hydrogens were chemically distinct. So anytime you replace one of the hydrogens with a deuterium, and then you do the same thing, but vice versa on the other structure, and you get stereoisomers, then you have chemically distinct hydrogens there. In fact, these are diastereomers, and therefore those hydrogens in a technical sense are diastereotopic for those who are interested. But again, going back to the actual answer to the question, the answer to the question was just this structure right here. And then you have that double bond. 